Good evening and welcome to the October 14th City Council meeting and uh, public forum. But before we begin our public forum, we are going to honor uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. And I would like to invite Joel Iboa of our Human Rights Commission to come up and make a presentation about Indigenous Peoples Day. Thank you, please. Good afternoon. I'm Mayor Venus and city councilors and community members. My name is Jolie Boa. I live in Ward 7 and I'm chair of the Eugene Human Rights Commission. Many of us have been fed the myth that Christopher Columbus discovered America. It is a lie that has been widely perpetuated for over 500 years, which culminated in the creation of a holiday that celebrates an individual who facilitated the genocide of 3 million people. These souls perished because of greed, disease, war, and slavery. I want to make it clear that Columbus was not the first person to visit the Americas. Nobody in 1492 thought that the world was flat. He was a slave trader who was dragged back to Spain, disgraced and in shackles. In 2016, we joined many other cities across the nation to celebrate the history, resilience, resistance, and survival of indigenous people in the Americas. As Governor Brown put it today, they've helped shape the character of Oregon and contributed in such enormous ways to our community through their knowledge, labor, science, philosophy, and arts. I remember in fifth grade, at Buena Vista Elementary learning about the Kalapuyas. As someone who was born and raised in the Whitaker, I had the opportunity to go to Skinner's Butte often. And we did this project on indigenous peoples in Oregon. And I remember going to Skinner's Butte with my father uh, and picking up different leaves and branches and creating a, a historic home of the Kalapuyas. I'm very grateful for that education. And I'm very happy that today in 2019, over 100 cities today have made declarations to change Columbus Day into Indigenous Peoples Day. And I want to thank you for your continued support of Indigenous and mar marginalized communities. While I'm excited that hundreds of communities across the nation have done so today, we did so in 2016. As always, Eugene has ahead of the curve. We've continued to be ahead of the curve and I thank you all uh, for your continued support for human rights in Eugene and for being a beacon of hope for other communities across the nation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. And now we are ready for our public forum. We have 39 people to present, so I'm going to leave it at three minutes. Um, I will call two names, and the second person can sit in the warm-up chair so that we can move through. I will remind everyone that we try to keep a quiet, uh, respectful audience here so that people can be heard and can uh, feel free to express their opinions uh, with some clarity and uh, being respected by everyone in the audience. So thank you very much for your patience as we go through and for and for coming today to tell us what's on your mind. So first up is Ralph McDonald, followed by Anna Bio. Thank you, Mayor Venice. Um, I promise to keep it under three minutes, which is a, sh a record, world record for me. <laughs> but I just want to thank the council for taking up the uh, youth-led climate re emergency resolution tonight. This, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the Eugene Sustainability Commission. And a couple of weeks ago, we passed a resolution unanimously supporting the 2019 youth-led climate strike here in Eugene and asking the City Council to uh, also endorse this resolution. I want to thank uh, Councillor Semple, who is also a member of the Sustainability Commission, 
um, and City Attorney Bretherton for uh, ushering this through uh, to the council tonight for um, uh, consideration later this evening. Um, also want to thank Betty Taylor for input on the initial uh, resolution. Um, thank you. Thank you. And I realized I uh, jumped ahead without actually uh, reminding everybody of the rules here, of how this works. So um, when your name is called and you come to the podium, I will give you, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residence, your ward if known. The timer and lights will indicate the time you have to speak. You have three minutes. When the red light comes on, it is a signal that your three minutes have finished. So with that, please, Anna Bio, followed by Becky Bruckner. Hello, thank you for letting me speak. I, I live in Emily uh, Semple's ward, and I'm here today because I came home from a two-day vacation, and I found all these trucks in front of my house at 21st and Lawrence, and they were putting up a pole, which I never was notified about for a 5G meter. And I'm really upset about it and devastated about health issues, about the value of my home and my neighbors and the children. I mean, it's right across from Washington Park where there's a, a nursery school, Splash Park, kids sports, and a number of other things. And um, I feel really outraged that I wasn't notified at all. I didn't know this was happening. I know I've been reading about 5G and that it, how there's not been enough uh, research done. And some of the research that has been done is very negative about health issues. And, um, you know, I feel, I kind of feel just kind of outraged that I wasn't notified by the city that this was happening in my community. And I know there's another one that I was told on uh, Washington and 26th Street, and I own a house, um, a rental house on Friendly, which is not very far from there. And I have a young woman who's six months pregnant, and I think, oh, great, you know, this might affect her and her child. And I wonder, you know, where are all these happening? I'm wondering if, you know, are they happening by your house? How do you feel? You know, are you being notified about these things? And I think um, it's, it, it's just not fair that we're not notified or and that there, it's happening without our input. And um, I really don't want it. And that's, that's my, th I'll give somebody else another minute. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Becky Bruckner, followed by Victor Odlovac. <clears throat> Becky Bruckner, um, today, October 14th, there is an installation going on, a 5G pole at the corner of 24th and Washington at Washington Park. The site was visited by members of Families for Safe Technology. Mass Tech will come and not on another day and install the antenna in the big brown box. I was out there talking to the workers today. Um, there was no public notice as required by your ordinance 20083. Under policies in your ordinance 7.302I, requirements for public notice. Why are you not notifying the public? That is a violation of your ordinance and you can be held liable for that. Number two, under policies, policy number four in your ordinance, telecommunications facilities must be located, installed, and maintained in a manner that minimizes visual impact and preserves the views. The city is placing this 5G pole right in front of a homeowner's living room window. This is not preserving their view. Instead of looking out to the beautiful Washington Park, they will view the ugly, monstrous pole, antenna, and big brown box. That's their view. Number three, under policies in the ordinance, number three, the public must be protected from adverse safety consequences stemming from the installation, maintenance, and operation of telecommunications facilities. In the city, 5G, 4G has not been safety tested, nor is it proven safe. So the people, children, babies, and pregnant mothers will be subjected to the safety consequences 
of the operation of this device. Installation of the brown cabinet box on the pole has a notice, and that notice says radiation, symbol on it, warning of, here's the warning, it's in quotes, beyond this point you are entering an area where radio frequency fields may be exceeded. It may exceed the FCC general population exposure limits. According to your ordinance 2083, the city prefers not to put 5G poles in residential areas. Well, then why are you doing it? Yeah. Why the hell are you doing it? The city prefers not to. It's, you're doing it all over the city. This is not an isolated installation. It is happening all over Eugene. Number five, section 7.302, section seven. <laughs> that the matters contained herein contain the public health, welfare, and safety. Where is the concern for the public health, welfare, and safety here? When you put Thank these you. devices up Thank you. in... Oh. Thank you. Victor Odlevac, followed by Sherry Martin. So I'm just finishing up where Becky left off. My name is Victor Odlevac. Uh, South Hills, Lorraine Highway. Uh, okay. Section 5, 7.303, section number 7, that the matters contained herein concern the public health, welfare, and safety. Where is the concern for public health, safety, and welfare? When you put these devices up in residential neighborhoods, literally feet from our homes, and right at the corner of Washington Park, Washington and 26, right in front of Anna, who spoke earlier, of her living room window. There's no concern for safety here. 5G has not been safely tested or proven safe. You are violating your own ordinance of April 28th, 1997. You can go on our website uh, just go under home and see all the dangers of 4G, 5G, wireless. It's, it's all up there under the home tab, familiesforsafetechnology.org. It is time for a new urgent ordinance based on aesthetics and utmost concern for the public safety, welfare, and health. This is allowed by the SEC. Look at Sonoma, uh, California's great urgent ordinance in effect for one year now. It's an emergency moratorium. This pole installation at 21st and Lawrence has to be stopped immediately as it is in violation of your outdated ordinance. This is a demand. Families for Safe Technology. Thank you. Sherry Martin, followed by Courtney Mills. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Venice and members of the Eugene City Council. My name is Sheree Martin and I'm the Advocacy Director at Mayrell Pro Trace Oregon. And as one of the seven in 10 Americans who support access to safe and legal abortion, I'm here to testify on behalf of Mayrell Pro Trace Oregon in support of a city resolution in opposition to state abortion bans. And on behalf of our 13,000 members statewide, I wanna thank Councillor Syret for her leadership in bringing this resolution forward. NARAL Pro Choice Oregon is dedicated to developing and sustaining a constituency that uses the political process to guarantee every person the right to make personal decisions regarding the full range of reproductive choices, including preventing unintended pregnancy, bearing healthy children, and choosing legal abortion. We believe everyone, especially those from communities of color, LGBTQ plus folks, trans and gender nonconforming individuals, people, people with lower income levels or from immig immigrant families deserve the tools to be able to make these personal decisions when and if they are ready. Unfortunately, politicians in states like Alabama, Ohio, and Georgia are signing blatantly unconstitutional bills into law to restrict abortion with the explicit goal of overturning Roe v. Wade. 27 abortion bans have been enacted across 12 states so far in 2019. And just this May, Alabama's governor signed the most restrictive abortion legisl legislation in the United States into law. With attacks like these at every turn, we should take action at the national level and support these organizations in these states. But we should also remember last November's uh, ballot measure 106 and know that the threats to safe and legal abortion in Oregon are as real as anywhere else. 
This legislative session alone, anti-abortion lawmakers introduced 11 pieces of legislation that would create dangerous barriers to reproductive health care access here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. These threats are real, which is why we applaud and support our local leaders in putting forth this important resolution that will send a message of solidarity to support the people living in states that are most impacted by these abortion bans. Thanks to your leadership, Eugene will continue to be a beacon for all people across our state as a city that uplifts and upholds access to the full range of reproductive health care options, including abortion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Courtney Mills, followed by Lori Trieger. Mayor Venice and members of the City Council, my name is Courtney Mills and I am Senior Counsel for State Legislative Affairs at NARAL Pro-Choice America. We, in partnership with our affiliates like NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon, organize our two and a half million members to make sure that leaders at every level hear from their constituents, the seven in 10 Americans who support legal abortion. I'm here to testify in support of the resolution to file amicus briefs in opposition to state abortion bans. The Supreme Court recognized a constitutional right to abortion in 1973, but reproductive freedom has been under a persistent attack from almost the moment that Roe v. Wade was announced. But this year has been different. And this year alone, we've seen 30 states introduce or enact bans on abortion. Five states passed extreme bans that outlaw abortion before many women even know they're pregnant. Another passed a ban at eight weeks, two more passed their own bans at 18 weeks. Additionally, four states passed so-called trigger bans, which would outlaw abortion essentially immediately if Roe v. Wade were overturned. Lawmakers in Texas granted a hearing to a bill that would have imposed the death penalty on women who have an abortion in order to make women, quote, more personally responsible. In Alabama, lawmakers passed a bill that would outlaw almost all abortions with the explicit intent of overturning Roe v. Wade at the Supreme Court. The bill's sponsor stated it plainly, quote, it's very simple. It simply criminalizes abortions. Small towns in numerous states are now attempting to follow suit. Cities like Eugene will be tasked with absorbing demand for care from other states should these anti-choice politicians succeed in making Roe fall. While we've seen states take efforts this year to ensure abortion remains legal in their state, it's not enough that states support reproductive freedom simply by ensuring the legality within your own borders. Those that are most likely to be impacted by these dangerous laws are women of color and low-income women who already are at a higher risk of death due to their pregnancy in this country. They already face numerous hurdles to receiving care and could struggle to reach a safe haven city like Eugene. Women deserve to have their rights protected where they and their families live. This resolution will allow you to take the next step and to help ensure these women keep their freedoms within their own cities across the country. The threat to reproductive freedom is real and urgent in this country. Your leadership can truly make a difference in this moment, and I urge you to support this critical resolution. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Lori Trieger, followed by Joshua Korn. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Venice, members of City Council. My name is Lori Trieger. I live in Ward 1, and I'm here as a NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon volunteer to testify in support of the resolution to affirm the City of Eugene's commitment to abortion access and to file amicus briefs in opposition to state abortion bans. As a mother, a grandmother, and a lifelong advocate for access to safe and legal abortion, I believe that everyone should have the right to make their own personal medical decisions regardless of whether they are black, brown, who they love, how much money they make, or how they are insured. But we've all seen recent headlines, legislators across the country introducing bills to restrict abortion that if passed would be blatantly unconstitutional. Just this year, Alabama passed a near total abortion ban. Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, Ohio, and Georgia all passed six-week so-called heartbeat bills. Missouri passed an eight-week ban, and Utah and Arkansas have passed 18-week bans. Oregonians and people across the country rely on our state and on Lane County to be a beacon of reproductive justice. 
people do travel from around our state and even from across this country to receive abortion services here in Eugene. In 2017, 844 people traveled from out of state to have their abortion in Oregon. We can be proud that we were able to provide them access to safe legal health care. By standing up against abortion bans, the city would send a message, a powerful message to the rest of the country. We won't go back and we will remain a sanctuary to access the full range of reproductive health care, including safe legal abortion. Thank you for your time tonight. And for these aforementioned reasons, I urge you to support the critical resolution that would protect abortion access here in Eugene and across this county. Thank you. Thank you. Joshua Korn, followed by Lori Siegel. Joshua Korn, uh, South, South Eugene. First, in response to the 5G work session from last Wednesday, in that discussion, it was mentioned that sometime in 2018, the first small cell uh, transmitter was installed in Eugene. I just want to put it on record that that is a complete incorrect statement. Small cell, tel small cell technology dates back at least a decade. It's this new 5G type of small cells that are starting to be installed in Eugene. And it's important for you guys to understand the differences in technology, how these new small cells are uh, favored by industry. There is a small cell transmitter, for example, on uh, 29th right near Amazon Park. It's been there for many, many years. Same as all the other cell towers, but it's in a residential area. It's on a power pole, just like these newer small cell technologies are being, are being proposed and installed uh, recklessly without concern for health and safety. And, um, and then as far as recent news, San Francisco has been battling and winning for local control uh, starting back in April, but continuing um, April 4th, 2019, California court challenged FCC's Telecommunications Act of 1996, which state that phone companies cannot install equipment that may, quote, incommode the public use of the road. State Supreme Court unanimously agreed that telecom companies have to abide by SF 2011 ordinance, which requires a permit for cell tower placement. Uh, this is T-Mobile West LLC versus City and County of San Francisco. California Supreme Court decision, First Appellate District uh, Division 5. And then further on, court states a city can require conditional use permits based on aesthetics. And aesthetics is not just visual aesthetics. This is much more. This discussion went on in your discussion the other day. This is much more than just visual aesthetics. Mobile West LLC versus City, uh, city, of San, city and County of San Francisco decided September 15th, 2019. <clears throat> Uh, the court stated, quote, in general, courts are cautious in applying the doctrine of implied preemption in view of the long tradition of local regulation and the leg legislatively imposed duty to preserve and protect public health. Preemption may not be lightly found. Where local legislation clearly serves local purposes, state legislation that appears to be in conflict actually Thank serves... You different Thank you. statewide purposes. Thank Preemption you. will Thank you, not please. be found. Thank you. Lori Siegel, followed by Sabrina Siegel. Hello, Council. Thank you for um, entertaining us today. I want to thank you for having a work session, the work session that you had on the 5G um, issue um, earlier, I guess it was last week. Um, I think that as with any issue, um, there needs to be follow-up to that work session. Um, you can't get anything done with one 45-minute discussion. It seemed like there were an, enough interest in asking staff to come back with some drafts of what 
an ordinance might look like, what you might be able to regulate. Um, and I would urge you to please consider asking staff to come back with some draft options for you to consider. For example, you talked about um, staffed, public works staff talked about um, looking for alternative locations and they talked about a 500 foot radius um, from a proposed site and looking within that 500 feet um, to see if there was an alternative. In the, in the case of, of the pole in front of my house, it's less than 500 feet from a commercial um, arterial, that being 30th Avenue. And so instead of it being sited on a partially dead end street, being East 29th Place, it could have been sited a block away, less than 500 feet on a major commercial arterial that doesn't have any dwellings, any homes on it. And that's what I would have liked to see. Um, the other issue I'd like to bring up is that we don't know where any of these are going. And, and when we've asked if the city knows and when we've asked if EWEB knows, um, we're told no, or if they do know, they're not telling us. And I would urge you to use your authority and your to, to require that you know where these proposed sites and these build outs would be. I mean, You've know, the city has known about this since 2014, and for us to find out about it when it comes up in front of our house, in the case of the two, a woman earlier and then myself in 2019, it just doesn't seem like the way this city normally operates. And I would urge you to that that you can do better on that. We can find out and let people know. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina Siegel, followed by Todd Boyle. <clears throat> I also attended the 5G work session on the 9th, and I wanted to thank those counselors that uh, did ask questions about making a more restrictive ordinance to protect the health, safety, and property of the citizens of Eugene. And uh, when, when the counselors did ask the questions, uh, we noticed that the city attorney and the public works were discouraging of the participation of the council and uh, so as not to interfere with their system that they have going for uh, permitting, et cetera, these uh, small cells, um, which is not protecting the public, nor is it uh, going about this in any sort of aesthetic way. Uh, we need the council to be strong. We need you to be strong on this and work to create an ordinance that truly considers the public uh, not allowing 5G in residential neighborhoods and the other seven points that Families for Safe Technology emailed you, uh, which came straight out of the ordinances of Sonoma, Monterey, and Burlington. Uh, they're, they're all, uh, all these ordinances have been in effect for a year, and they're meeting the FCC 332-7A code requirements. And um, Sarah Maderi opened the work session noting uh, that there would be no discussion of the science related to the health effects on this technology, so that wasn't uh, addressed at all. Uh, and, and you really need to get deep into that, you know, for your decision-making process. Um, so that requires uh, another another work session and a never, another several work sessions to get into to the science and to get into the details of an aesthetic urgency ordinance, which is much needed. When will you hold the next work session, dear council? When will you hold the session? Um, it'd be most responsible to put a halt to the build out of the infrastructure while you're working on the details of the new ordinance. Uh, we need you to take the reins on this. We need you to be strong. We need you to represent us, the citizens, and not the city staff representing the uh, telecoms or whoever it is that they are. So thank you for being strong. Thank you for your questions, uh, council. Stay the course. <laughs> thank you. Todd Boyle, followed by Jaden Salama. Salama. 
Hi, gang. Todd Boyle, I live at uh, 30th and Hilliard area. And um, I came to speak on behalf of the uh, low income population of Eugene, uh, who um, about a year ago, the results of the housing tools and strategies were presented by Ann Fifield and others here in this chamber. And she said that 36,000 people live on less than $1,000 a month in Eugene. And that comes from the uh, Census Bureau, like all the statistics. We don't have any other statistics besides the Census Bureau, as far as I know. Anyway, in the last few a couple of weeks, I videoed the Housing Policy Board and put it on YouTube. And uh, Denny Broad's uh, presentation of downtown achievements at the City Club, that's on YouTube. And uh, uh, last couple of days, the two-day uh, community impact kickoff in, in uh, Cottage Grove, that'll be on, on YouTube in a, a couple of days. Wayne Martin's homeless group and Ann Montero's death memorial. Um, anyway, so what about these 36,000 people who are trying to live on less than $1,000 a month? And that's 20% of Eugene. That's a lot of people who are out of the market. And uh, the bottom 10% are living on less than 700 a month. And how much rent can they afford? And many of these people are paying all their cash that they can scrape together to pay their rent. And so uh, these people can afford like $300 a month or less, the most of them, and a lot less, many of them. And so um, they are out of the market. So they are not in the dollar market economy, and they are not going to have a job, they're not going to have higher income, and they are uh, never going to have money. And uh, so we have to do something about these people. In fact, they live here, and they have a right to live here. They have a right to live without being a participant in the dollar economy with the New York money and the war economy that comes out of Washington, D.C. And uh, so what I'm going to ask is that, that you do something. City Council should lead and not follow what's going on with the uh, boards and commissions that I attend regularly, and I wish I would see more of you. Thank you for uh, Emily and, and uh, Chris, who I see, and none of you otherwise, I don't see any of you at the boards and commissions. So what you should do is tell the Planning Commission, the Human Rights Commission, the Intergovernmental Housing Policy Board, and the uh, Poverty and Homelessness Board uh, that uh, they should come up with a solution. So how are these 20% of the people in Eugene who are not in the money economy how are they supposed to live in Eugene without having money? And they're not going to have money. Get over it. The rents are going up way faster than they are making money. And you need to find a way. You should tell these boards and commissions to, you should instruct them that there is a problem. There is a problem. And you should require that they give a solution outside of the market that's not requiring them to come up with money or some dreams that there's going to be a growth in the economy and all this stuff. And you should uh, get, we need 10,000 new units, 10,000 below 300 a month. Thank you. Thank you. You can use, you can wiggle your fingers. Please keep it quiet. Jaden Salama, followed by Catherine Rohan. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Jaden Salama. I live in the Calpoli Elihi Residence Hall at the University of Oregon, Ward 3. I'm here tonight to advocate for the future residents of Eugene, Oregon. I grew up biking in Portland, and in high school I found myself under the tutelage of an ex-bike messenger who was the captain of the bike team that I was on. He advocated for bike safety while riding, but also taught many strategies on how to stay safe and alive on the roads that we were riding, particularly out in the country where there weren't any bike lanes. So the bike lane was kind of considered an um, appreciated luxury, but not necessary for riding. I grew used to riding this way, and that was convenient because when you can ride when there, when there aren't bike lanes, then you can ride kind of wherever you want, which is really nice. Um, so coming to Eugene and biking around Eugene wasn't really much of a switch for me because I was comfortable riding on the roads. However, I quick I quickly learned when I was um, when my mom came to visit, or when I was trying to ride around with my girlfriend, that um, the the really great bike infrastructure that's um, found kind of around campus quickly just evaporates once you get a few blocks off campus. Um, and the bike lanes that I did encounter, I was struggling because I wanted to ride side by side with my partner and talk to them. Uh, humans are very social people. And so I was struggling. I had to ride either in front or behind, which you don't really like, you don't feel good. You don't, when you have a conversation with somebody, you don't stand behind them and you don't stand in front of them. You, you stand other side by side and you look, look at them. And if I'd be biking on Hilliard, taking either of them to downtown, I would run into a sign that said bike lane ends. Imagine if you ran into a sign that said 
road ends. Um, in order to stay safe, and I mean, if I was by myself, what I would just do is I would go and just kind of really ride really fast to try and make it a block where I can get onto the protected sidewalk. But I can't count on them to ride as fast as I do, and so I have to do a complicated maneuver where I pull, pull up on the sidewalk, cross the crosswalk, and then I ride on the sidewalk. Um, that's, that's really, inconvenient and hard to do, especially when you're just trying to show somebody around who's not really all that experienced on a bike. We should not be half, we, we should be able to ride just forward on a bike. We shouldn't have to turn, you on a, on a car, you have uninterrupted road. Sometimes there are one ways and things like that, but you aren't forced to go around places. Um, we may have some really great bike infrastructure in Eugene, but I dream of a day when we do not have a single uh, bike lane end sign here. I want us to do the hard work of putting safety, convenience, and climate conscious infrastructure ahead of space taken up by parked boxes. Thank you. Catherine Rohan, followed by Finley Heeb. Hi. Uh, my name is Katherine Rohan. I live in the Fairmont neighborhood, Ward 3, and I'm a student here at UO. Um, I've never spoken at one of these meetings, so it's a little exciting and uh, a little scary, but thank you all for listening. Um, and I'm here to ask for safer streets and bicycle infrastructure. But I'm also here to remind you that we are, this is a community. And a community is more than just sharing resources and voting. It's, it's showing up and investing in the ongoing creation of one another's lives. And time and again, we've demonstrated that investment by creating plans that do just that. Plans that invest in the future and each other. Um, and I'm talking about Vision Zero, our climate goals, the transportation systems plan, and Envision Eugene. We came together as a community to make those. Wasn't just me, wasn't just you, wasn't one subset of Eugene. And all of those plans, they call for safer streets, equitable transportation options, and a shift away from single occupancy vehicles. And do you know what can get us there? It's bike infrastructure. <laughs> Literally half of a vehicle lane to help us reach all of these community goals. And that's, that's kind of ridiculous, you know? In a lot of places, that's all it takes half a lane. And that's really exciting because it seems so doable. But for some reason, we seem to have trouble with that, you know, because as in all things, some people push back. Um, and my response to that is, you know, please look beyond your bubble. Please come join this community and share our plans. Um, because if you care for the people in your community and their future, they will care for you. And we've got big plans, um, exciting plans, as you all know. Um, and I, for one, can't wait to see those put into action, one protected bike lane at a time, because that's what it takes. Um, and as council, I hope you too can do this, you know, can look beyond a single bubble and can support and empower city staff and the city manager, be it John or Sarah, you know, to carry our plans and prioritize investments in bicycle infrastructure and safer streets. Thank you. Thank you. Finley Heeb, followed by Sean Vermilia. Hi, my name is Finley Heeb, and I live in the Friendly Area neighborhood in Ward 1. Um, I'm here today to ask you to please prioritize human lives over driver convenience. I'm a student at the University of Oregon and I travel primarily by bike. Every day I commute to campus and back at least once but often twice. In the last year, I have been hit twice, uh, both times at 18th and Hilliard by a driver turning without look, check, look, checking the bike lane. Um, the first time they uh, fractured my knee and they totaled my bike. The second time, I was biking with my roommate and they tried to turn between the two of us and hit us both. Naturally, I wanna find an alternative, so I've tried biking on 19th. Due to a complete lack of bike infrastructure on 19th, I've found that drivers often get very aggressive, 
Um, so I've been honked at, I've been yelled at, I've had somebody intentionally try to hit me, all directly in front of South Eugene High School. And that's what transportation culture in Eugene is currently like. I'm here to ask for a safer bike network so that Eugene is accessible to non-car travel. This will mean making it harder to drive, but some people will push back against that. Cities are not a place for cars. They are a place for people. So we must move past this because our transportation infrastructure needs to reflect our values for people. I'm asking you to listen to the people who bike, walk, and bus as much as you listen to the people who drive and are angry about losing a parking spot for somebody's life to be safer. There are no excuses for not having bike infrastructure on every street in Eugene. There are no excuses for making people put their lives at risk just to get where they need to go. There are no excuses for prioritizing metal boxes over people. And there are no excuses for not changing transportation culture in Eugene. So on behalf of my friends, my neighbors, and my community, I am asking you to prioritize our lives and safety over driver convenience, parking, and faster car lanes. Thank you for your consideration and your action. Thank you. Sean Vermilia, followed by Ahiza Whalen. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Sean Vermilia, and I live in Ward 3 near the University of Oregon. As some have already discussed, I'm here tonight to urge the city to invest in better cycling infrastructure. My friend Finley just discussed the dangers of cycling in Eugene. I'm going to tell you a very similar story from the perspective of a driver. This past week, I was driving with my partner to grab some dinner. As I turned left from 18th Avenue onto Hilliard Street, my partner screamed. I slammed on the brakes as I realized I was inches away from hitting a cyclist. Luckily, we did not collide, yet the experience shocked me. As a regular cyclist myself, I always remain diligent as a driver uh, uh, for fellow cyclists on Eugene streets. I check bike lanes as I go past or across. I yield to cyclists whenever I can. And despite these precautions, I still nearly hit someone. These situations are frightening as a driver. They're terrifying and behavior changing as a cyclist. Having nearly been hit on a bike myself, I felt immense guilt driving away from that near collision, knowing that I may have made that cyclist feel permanently unsafe on Eugene streets. But these situations can be avoided if not eliminated entirely. At the intersection I nearly hit that cyclist, there is no paint in the intersection alerting drivers that they're crossing a bike lane. A sign alerts drivers to yield to oncoming traffic, but trees on the north side of 18th obscure drivers' ability to see the bike lane, making it impossible to see cyclists until they're practically entering the intersection. This is just one example of poorly designed cycling, or a poorly designed cycling intersection in Eugene. Eugene's Vision Zero Plan identified 22 high crash intersections like the one I almost crashed in, the same one Finley was hit at twice. Yet Eugene prides itself on its robust cycling infrastructure. The city encourages cycling and wants more people to use bike bicycles. Its successful bike share program is evidence of that. It is frequently ranked among the best cycling cities in America. At the same time, bicycle infrastructure is not robust enough to ensure the safety of riders. As long as the city continues to encourage cycling without providing necessary infrastructure improvements, accidents and near misses will continue to occur. Drivers will remain frightened and would-be cyclists will remain wary of venturing out onto city streets. The city must do more to ensure its streets are safe for everyone, not just convenient for those in a car. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ahiza Whalen, followed by Rachel Cohen. My name is Eliza Whalen. Oh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> I live in Ward 3, and I am a master's student at the U of O. The city has set a number of goals related to climate change, safety, and accessibility. I am proud to live in a city with such values. But goals and values, they don't protect people on bikes. Infrastructure does. Drivers feel entitled to the road, and they feel that so deeply that they frequently endanger, intimidate, and injure people on bikes. And why shouldn't they? Roads are designed for cars. To change that, we need comprehensive and connected bike infrastructure. Every day that you make choices not in support of these changes are days that people 
on bikes take serious risks with their safety. And it makes me so mad that human lives are a lower priority than parking spaces or uh, another traffic lane. I want to live in a community where people of all ages and abilities can ride through town, connecting with each other and the city around them. We may not achieve that joy, freedom, and engagement though without infrastructure that supports people on bikes. Please choose this future and empower staff to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Cohen, followed by Rebecca Lewis. Good evening, my name is Rachel Cohen. I'm a resident of Ward 3, and I'm a master's student at the University of Oregon Center for Sustainable Business Practices. The specific ask here tonight is for more, better, and safer bicycle infrastructure in the city of Eugene. But I want to zoom out here a bit and talk about the return on investment that transportation can generate for the city's economy in addition to the environment. When we design cities through the lens of the pedestrian, the cyclist, and the transit rider, we find unexpected ways to make cities more vibrant, more equitable, and more sustainable. Research shows that when we add people-first design elements to streets like bike lanes and green spaces, we see increased revenues at small and local businesses. Reduced traffic on roads means more goods and services that can flow efficiently in and out of the city. Improving livability and quality of life in this city is an excellent way to attract and retain a vibrant workforce. Giving residents more opportunities to walk, bike, and take transit to and from work can reduce lost revenue from employee turnover and increase business productivity. Finally, providing a greater variety of clean and active transportation options has long-term benefits for public health and public safety. All of us, as individuals, business leaders, and policymakers, have a role to play in addressing the climate crisis. Passenger transportation is a large contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in this country, as is concrete and other carbon intensive materials that are used to build infrastructure for the car. If the city of Eugene is serious about achieving the goals outlined in its climate recovery ordinance, transportation policy and infrastructure present some of the greatest opportunities to reduce its carbon footprint that are directly within its reach. As you make decisions about public space, urban form, and transportation, I urge you to remember that what's good for the environment can also be good for the economy and for people. Thank you. Thank you. Rebecca Lewis, followed by Mark Schlossberg. Good evening. I'm Rebecca Lewis, and I've lived in Ward 1 in Jefferson West Side for six years, and I'm faculty at the University of Oregon. I'm a bicycle commuter and rely on the bicycle for most errands and trips within five miles. I'm here to advocate for safer streets for people of all ages and abilities using all modes of transportation. I'm a confident cyclist and in my experience relying on a bicycle as a primary mode of transportation, I see many issues for less confident cyclists, particularly children and seniors. Only 6.5% of Eugene residents use a bicycle get to work currently. If we're to meet the ambitious goals of the TSP, the CRO, Vision Zero, and Envision Eugene, it's important to provide a connected, convenient, safe network for cyclists and pedestrians. I live right off of Polk and was devastated to hear about an aggressive incident this summer between a driver and a group of cyclists. I ride this route frequently to move north-south between the Whitaker and Friendly neighborhood. My sister who lives in uh, Friendly also rides this route, sometimes with my young nephews who are age three and six. I'm consistently honked at on the street and other streets while following the rules of the road. Just yesterday, a driver sped around me and flipped me off as I was biking on Monroe, just over the Sharrows. How can I expect my nephews to ride a mile between my house and their house if I can't do, don't feel safe on these streets? I believe that we will fail to achieve the goals of our plans if we do not provide safer infrastructure for cyclists and pedestrians now. Transportation is the long, largest single source of carbon emissions in this country and the city. And while it's great to stand by climate goals and I encourage you to stand with our youth in rallying for climate, we have to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. That means driving less and using less carbon intensive modes of transportation more. We can't do that without investing in infrastructure. Specifically, I would like to see a commitment to repurposing on-street parking and travel lanes on low-volume neighborhood streets. I strongly feel that we need protected infrastructure to create safe places for biking and walking. 
We also need to make it more difficult for drivers to pass through neighborhood streets. Diversions at 12th Street on, between Monroe and Polk and Alder Street and 19th are great examples. I encourage you to support plans that will achieve and better serve our communities in the long run to provide a safer environment for people of all ages and levels of cycling confidence. As you think in coming weeks about long-term investments in transit and cycling infrastructure in downtown, please think about the future and remember that we have to invest in infrastructure today to shift our behaviors and achieve community goals already established in our plans. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mark Schlossberg, followed by Chelsea Jennings. Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. I'm Mark Schlossberg. I'm in Councilor Zelenka's ward. I've lived in Eugene for almost 20 years. I've raised three children here, and I'm also a professor of city planning at the U of O, where my work on redesigning cities so that more people can walk, bike, and take transit more of the time is being used by communities all over the world. I think these things, I think um, these are things that you want as well, since you've approved a climate action plan, Envision Eugene, a transportation system plan, and Vision Zero as a guiding framework for, for safe street design. So I'm here today to urge you to recommit to these important goals by doing three things. One, publicly reiterate your goals to triple the mode share of non-automobile trips and eliminate traffic deaths on our streets. Two, demand accountability of your new city manager on these council passed goals to make safe streets and climate action a priority. And three, support city staff when they do do the work in support of your goals and still receive pushback from the community. Staff must know that you have their back because making changes to our streets to meet our climate, equity, and safety goals almost always encounters pushback because change is hard. Did you know that it's not even possible for kids to bike safely to our downtown library? Is that the type of community that we can be proud of? If you were not serious about the Climate Action Plan, Envision Eugene, the Transportation System Plan, Envision Zero, then undo them. Otherwise, the time is now to make our streets safer, faster, more affordable, and more climate friendly for those who move by foot, by bike, or by bus. Thank you for listening, considering my points and our points, and for continuing to step up in public service. I know, I especially know these days, that it isn't always easy to be a public servant, and I appreciate that you have chosen to serve our community in this way. Thank you. Chelsea Jennings, followed by Kimberly Coops. Mayor Venice and Council, my name is Chelsea Jennings, and I serve as the Field Director of Planned Parenthood Advocates of Oregon. On behalf of the 60,000 Oregonians Planned Parenthood serves every year, Planned Parenthood Advocates of Oregon strongly supports the resolution to file amicus briefs in opposition to state abortion bans. One in four people in this country will have an abortion in their lifetime. A patient's health should drive important medical decisions, not a politician's beliefs. These issues are between individuals, their families, and their doctors. Abortion is safe and has been legal in this country for more than four decades. But now our rights and freedoms hang in the balance. Since 2011, politicians have passed more than 400 new state abortion restrictions that shame, pressure, and punish those that decide to have an abortion. And just this year, an unprecedented number of extreme abortion bans are being enacted across the country. This isn't a coincidence. After a decades-long strategy of chipping away at abortion access state by state, the abortion bans that are sweeping the country are an attempt to ban abortion outright. This is not just an attack on the people who live in those states. This is an attack on all of us, on every single person who might or can get pregnant. And on October 4th, the Supreme Court announced that they'll be taking up a major abortion case, Louisiana's Act 620, an abortion restriction nearly identical to one of the Texas restrictions struck down by the Supreme Court just three years ago. This case could decide the future of abortion access in this country. If the Supreme Court allows this elite Louisiana law to stand, it will be defying precedent and could make the protections of Roe v. Wade virtually meaningless. 
If Roe v. Wade is overturned, one in three people of reproductive age lives in a state where abortion could be outlawed. That's more than 25 million people. And due to discriminatory public policy and systematic racism, people of color, queer people, and those with low incomes already face significant barriers in accessing health care. It is clear that in a world where abortion is illegal, those who already face the greatest barriers to accessing quality health care will further bear the brunt of the harm. Oregonians rely on our state and Lane County to be a center for reproductive health care access. With this resolution, the city of Eugene has the opportunity to send a message to the rest of the country. We value an individual's health and bodily autonomy, and we will not permit any erosion of those fundamental rights. Planned Parenthood Advocates of Oregon urges you to support this critical resolution to protect abortion access here in Eugene and across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly Coops, followed by Mariah Clark. Mayor Venice and members of the City Council, my name is Kimberly Coops and I'm here on behalf of Chelsea Sullivan, who is a NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon volunteer who couldn't be here this evening. I'm here as a NARAL Pro-Choice Oregon volunteer to testify in support of the resolution to affirm the City of Eugene's commitment to abortion access and to file amicus briefs in opposition to state abortion bans. I understand that this resolution will be introduced later this month by Councillor Syrett. Thank you, Councillor Syrett for your leadership on this important issue. Abortion rights are under attack like never before. Just this year, Alabama passed a near total abortion ban. Kentucky, Mississippi, Louisiana, Ohio, and Georgia passed six week heartbeat bans. Missouri passed an eight week ban. And Utah and Arkansas have passed 18 week bans. As a young woman who has grown up in a country where abortion is safe and legal, I am deeply concerned by these actions. Oregonians and people across the country rely on our state to move the dial forward on reproductive health care access. People travel from around the state and the country to receive abortion services here, and it is imperative that we send a message that our doors will stay open. In 2018, Eugenians voted overwhelmingly, 79% to 21%, to defeat Measure 106, a backdoor ban on abortion. The voters were sending a message that abortion bans aren't welcome here and that Eugene will remain a place where everyone has access to the full range of reproductive health care, regardless of their circumstances. I'm glad to see my city taking a stance on this issue. By standing up against abortion bans, the city of Eugene is sending a message to the rest of the country. We won't go back and we will remain a sanctuary to access the full range of reproductive health care, including safe and legal abortion. Thank you for your time. For the aforementioned reasons, I urge you to support this critical resolution to protect abortion access here in Eugene and across the country. Thank you. Mariah Clark, followed by Ruby Jernigan. Hi, uh, thank you Mayor Venice and members of City Council. My name is Mariah Clark and I am a volunteer leader with Planned Parenthood, both locally here in the state of Oregon and nationally. I'm also a lifelong Oregonian and I've lived in the Eugene Springfield area for the last 10 years. I'm here today to testify in support of the resolution to file amicus briefs to in opposition of state abortion bans. As Oregonians, we believe that everyone has the right to make their own personal medical decisions regardless of their identities. But we've all seen the recent headlines. Legislators across the country have been introducing bills to restrict abortion, and if passed, those would be blatantly unconstitutional. You've heard some examples earlier. Despite the values of personal autonomy that I know for a fact Oregonians hold dear, last year Measure 106 reminded us that the threats to safe and legal abortion here in Oregon are as real as ever. I personally am so incredibly grateful to my fellow Oregonians who showed their support for the No on Measure 106 campaign. Without their votes, I may not have been able to access abortion care when I needed it. This legislation, legislative session alone here in Oregon, anti-choice lawmakers have introduced 11 pieces of anti-choice legislation, further threatening my access to the full range of reproductive health care services. Anti-abortion 
Proponents also attempt to say that people of color believe that abortion access should be restricted. But recent polling from the National Asian Pacific American People's Forum, the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, and in our own voice, National Black People's Reproductive Justice Agenda shows this to be patently false. Research has also consistently found that queer people are more likely to experience poverty than non-queer people. And because impoverished people are more likely to rely on healthcare facilities already that provide abortion, closing these clinics and facilities means severing some of our most marginalized within our community from the care that they need. I know from my time with the National Storytellers of Planned Parenthood that Oregon really is seen as a beacon of hope for equitable reproductive health across the country. I have friends in Alabama, in Missouri, in all of these states where abortion bans have been passed and they all turn to Oregon saying, what can we do to fight these? So um, by standing up against these abortion bans, the Eugene City Council, the city of Eugene is sending a message to the rest of the country that we take care of our own no matter what, that we won't go back, and that we will remain a sanctuary to access the full range of reproductive health care, including safe and legal abortion. Thank you. Thank you. Ruby Jernigan, followed by Jesse uh, Hubie or hubby. Hi, good evening. My name is Ruby. I'm here with uh, the youth movement Sunrise Eugene. I live in West Eugene. On September 20th, 2019, millions of people worldwide rose up and made their voices heard. That day, we went on strike and demanded climate action from our leaders that reflects the scale of the emergency we are in. Today, we are asking you to vote in support of the climate strikes. Though your vote today on supporting the climate strikes is symbolic, it has meaning and purpose. The overarching demand of the climate strikes across the US and the North Star of the Sunrise Movement is the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is a 10-year plan to mobilize every aspect of American society to 100% clean and renewable energy by 2030. A guaranteed living wage job for anyone who needs one and a just transition for workers and frontline communities. If you support those goals, we are asking that today you vote yes in support of the climate strikes and moving forward, we are asking you to implement a strong new climate action plan. We are looking forward to working with you for climate and economic justice. Thank you for your action. Thank you. Jesse, Hubie, Hubby, you'll have to correct me. Hubie. Thank you. Yeah. Followed by Claire Gillies. My name is Jesse Hubie, and I live in the Friendly Street neighborhood. Um, please vote tonight in support of the climate strikes and, in, and implement a strong new Eugene Climate Action Plan by the end of the year. These are critical steps on the way to winning a Green New Deal. Please do your part in giving me a future I can look forward to. Thanks. Thank you. Claire Gillies or Gillies? Gillies. Claire Gillies followed by Lex Warden. Hello, my name is Claire Gillies. Um, I'm 21 and I live in Ward 3. Please vote tonight in support of the climate strikes and implement a strong new Eugene Climate Action Plan by the end of the year. These are critical steps on the way to winning a Green New Deal. Please do your part in giving me a future I can look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Lex Warden, followed by Abraham Lickwarnick. Hello, um, my name is Lex. I am in District 3. Um, before um, I'd like to just speak to today's city council meeting is being on held on Indigenous Peoples Day, which we have acknowledged, and I thank you for that already being acknowledged at the beginning. Um, but right now we hold this meeting on Kalapuya land. To speak about the climate crisis is to also acknowledge our history and the multitude of sovereign nations whose land this country was founded on. However, the land has become sick and with it, the species that depends on it. Let us strive together for hope and for healing. We are the Sunrise Movement. We are asking you all to, tonight to vote in support of the climate strikes and implement a strong new Eugene Climate Action Plan by the end of the year. Will everyone here tonight who supports this resolution please stand up or raise a, ri a, raise a fist? Council, 
Please help us with a Green New Deal. Please do your part in giving us a future we can look forward to. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Abraham Lickwarnick, followed by Bill O'Brien. Abraham Lickwarnick, domiciled in Southwest Eugene. You can ban small cell towers today based on two categories that are not regulated by the FCC, and that is privacy and security. I'm going to read an article written by uh, a professor and dean of the College of Engineering and Computing Science, Computer Sciences at New York Institute of Technology. Five G will also unleash new security risks. Hyper connectivity will give cyber criminals and hostile foreign countries more opportunities to hack our devices and networks, imperiling our wealth and our lives. It's crucial that regulators, companies, and consumers start shoring up their defenses fast. The spread of 5G will accelerate the Internet of Things, devices such as thermostats, fitness monitors, refrigerators, alarm clocks, light bulbs, and even dog collars that connect to the web. This enhanced connectivity will make daily routines more efficient and convenient, but it will also open the floodgates for cyber criminality. Imagine the opportunities criminals will enjoy once every electronic device is 5G capable. Burglars could hack smart thermostats, which learn then families le when families leave their homes to discover when the house may be empty. Predators could hack 5G connected security cameras to peek into children's rooms. Criminals have already hacked 4G devices. In 2016, the infamous Miari botnet took control of 300,000 internet-connected devices to launch a massive denial-of-service attack that knocked out, knocked out internet connections for most of the eastern seaboard. Imagine these same actors obtaining control of 5G remote-controlled surgery machines delivery drones, or automated cars. The possibilities are endless. A hiker who uses her 5G smartwatch to share a geolocated Instagram post of her morning trek could inadvertently allow strangers to track her movements. Thank you. Thank you. Bill O'Brien, followed by Carolyn Partridge. Yeah, hello. Um, I, I was a little disappointed in a way, and maybe I'm biased. I mean, Miss Mayor, you have a very, uh, uh, you have a lot of authority, a lot of uh, responsibility. But I saw your picture in the newspaper with President Schill and um, um, whatever, you know, with these people at this, you, you, you really support obviously the World Track and Field Championships in 2021. And uh, my problem is um, I would really, in your, in your authority, your power that you have, um, maybe you don't have much power because, for example, I'm really concerned about this uh, Phil and Penny Knight research uh, facility over there at the campus. And, the, and what I think is going to happen, this is maybe out of left field, I think what's going to happen over there, you're going to, be building a race of superhuman beings. Okay, we're gonna we're entering this phase of technology where Star Trek going to Mars, going to Pluto. So we might as well build superhuman beings, you know. And so you got the World Track and Field Championships coming up two years from now, and uh, basically you got people that are have almost superhuman capacities. You know, it's wonderful to watch them, 
But unfortunately, uh, <laughs> you know, I got right here, you know, um, the USDA doping authority has uh, gotten rid, rid, in, rid of the uh, Oregon project. You know, in other words, they said, you are breaking rules. You are giving testosterone and L-carotene to your athletes. It's unfair. And uh, Mark Parker, CEO of Nike, says, oh, it's okay. You know, we're just, it's, we're doing just what's legal. And we're doing it because our rivals may be cheating. So we have this incredible competition, you know, between Nike, Adidas, whoever. And then on top of that, you know, good, I got 50 seconds. I don't like to be here anyway. But um, you got this lady, Bridget Kasegi. She runs a 214 marathon, man. It's wonderful. Woman. She, she beat any kind of time a man could run 60 years ago. Totally out, just obliterated mankind, the, the, the male, the male, you know. Well, right, right off the bat, they said to her, you know, you did a wonderful time. Two years ago, you... You improve your time by six minutes. That's uh, about a mile and a quarter. You know, that's phenomenal. Now, between 2014 and 2018, the uh, World Anti-Doping Authority, <laughs> you know, worldwide body, not the USDA Doping Authority, there, have been, there were 138 Kenyans Thank that you. tested positive for illegal drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn Partridge, followed by Jim New. Oh, thank you. Hello, Mayor Venice and Councilors. My name is Carolyn Partridge, and I live in Betty Taylor's ward. I don't know whether I'm here to convince you we are in a climate emergency or to remind you we're in a climate emergency. Nonetheless, I'm here again, this time to urge you to pass a climate emergency declaration. 350 has submitted a possible declaration for your consideration. I believe this declaration is important for two reasons. One is that you are a government body elected by the people to deliberate and act in the best interests of the citizenry. Your voice has clout and respect beyond that of a mere individual or an environmental group. And the people need to get this message in the most trusted way. Secondly, in order to meet Climate Action Plan goals, you will need to take measures such as prohibiting fossil fuel infrastructure expansion, raising taxes to fund more mass transit, and so forth. None of these measures will be received by the general public happily. They need to be explained in the context of an emergency. <clears throat> the consequences of inaction need to be described truthfully. Extreme floods, droughts, wildfires, heat waves, and species extinction are all on the near horizon. Stephen Hawking and Carl Sagan both wrote that global warming is the most serious crisis facing mankind. A recent scientific expedition in the East Siberia Sea found the most powerful seep of underwater methane ever recorded. It was caused by melting permafrost due to warming oceans. This is the type of feedback loop that scientists fear most. Replacing permafrost is out of human control. No wonder young people are striking. We should all be out there with them. Thank you. Thank you. Jim New, followed by Deborah McGee. Mayor, Mayor Council uh, and City Manager, my name is Jim New. I live in Ward 7. I should be talking tonight about honoring indigenous people on this day or your support of a climate strike resolution, but instead will address your well-intentioned past decisions are not what they appear. Lane County gave a 99-year lease to a half, a half block on 6th Street 
to ex-Mayor Brian Obey to build the $75 million Gordon Building. The City of Eugene granted Mr. Obey's project $4.3 million, a 10-year multi-use property tax exemption for the project. In September, it was announced with great fanfare that Nike will be another tenant of a 6,500, will, I'm sorry, will be the anchor tenant of a 6,500 square foot storefront in the Gordon Building that the county leased and the city subsidized. Last week, it was reported by the Associated Press that the much celebrated anchor tenant, Nike, bankrolled and knowingly supported its Nike Project Oregon's track coach, Albert, Alberto Salazar, who was administering performance-enhancing hormone drugs to his athletes and his kids. Nike even contracted an endocrinologist, Dr. Jeffrey Brown, to help administer the drugs. Salazar, Brown, and Nike knowingly infused athletes to gain an advantage in the 2012 Olympics in London. The U.S. Anti-Doping Agency states these athletes and his kids were used as guinea pigs by Salazar and Nike to the extent of falsifying medical records. Tell me how this is any different than Big Pharma and the opioid crisis. Individuals and corporations seek personal and financial gain at another's expense. And now, the county's 99-year leasey and the city's recipient of a multi-year and multi-million dollar tax subsidy, Brian Obey, celebrates the store opening of a corporate athletic doping promoter and funder. This sets a poor example for Lane County and the city of Eugene. Allowing Nike to operate business as usual demonstrates to all who live in and visit our city that Lane County and Eugene put the corporate dollar over public moral. Nike should be shown the exit door and told, we just can't do it. As the saying goes, those who lay with dogs get fleas. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah McGee, followed by Ron Unger. Good evening, my name is Deborah McGee. I've lived in Lane County for 37 years. Honest, truthful discussion amongst the populace is how cultures and societies change for the better. That's what happened in the 1830s when neighbors started saying to each other out loud, selling other people's children for profit and enslaving people, that's wrong. Times change. Later, when women started to say, hey, no fair. The law says I can't own property and can't inherit from my family. Who makes those laws? I want the vote. Protests, demands, and civil conversations turned the human herd. To divest in the destructive, multi-trillion dollar slavery economy and women fought, went to jail, and won the right to vote after 100 years of struggle. Times change. In 1965, at age 13, I came to understand that I was gay. Defined by the culture as a homosexual, I was a mental illness diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. My lover was abducted from her dorm room, put into a straitjacket, and given electroshock therapy as a cure. But on August 16th of 2014, I was able to legally marry the woman I had loved for 24 years, retired Commander U.S. Navy Patricia Hine. I never imagined in my one lifetime I'd go from labeled a mental illness diagnosis to achieving marriage equality. You see, the human herd turned toward the light, making it better for everyone. Times change. We stand at a similar life-changing crossroad. World scientists say we have 10 years to prevent unstoppable climate catastrophic tipping points. That does not mean starting in 10 years. If we don't get on it today, we will not reach the goal in 10 years of moving t away from fossil fuels toward clean, renewable energy. 10 years ago, the City of Eugene Council passed a climate action plan, and so little progress has been made that our greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. We are seeing climate emergency consequences. We had two extreme weather events last winter. We know that California fires are coming. We know that in 19 years there will be no snowpack in the Oregon Mountains. Fossil fuels are killing our species, and we have to give them up in order to survive. It was hard for people to give up their slaves, but they had to. 
We have to get off fossil fuels. The number one action recommended by the City of Eugene staff to address the implementation of the cap with the really big gap regarding greenhouse emission reduction, the number one action is to limit or prohibit expansion of new methane gas customers. No more new fossil fuel infrastructure. You need to prohibit the infrastructure to close the gap in our climate recovery ordinance. Other cities have seen the light and done this. You must do so too. Thanks. Thank you. Ron Unger, followed by Robin Bloomgarden. Yeah, greetings to the mayor and the council. Um, I'm from Ward 3. Um, I work as a, a counselor in mental health. And one thing I know um, is people kind of like to feel like that they're, they're mentally healthy, and they often try to figure out whether they're healthy or not by figuring out if they're normal. Um, but unfortunately, normal doesn't always ensure health. Or as um, one psychiatrist I know it put it, just because a plane is flying in formation doesn't mean it's on course, because maybe <laughs> everybody's off course. And I, I think that's kind of what's true in our civilization right now. Um, it's actually normal not to worry too much about climate change. Um, maybe to make a few moves about it, but not to take it like an emergency. But it's, it's time to be abnormal. Because as my friend David Oak says, normal people are destroying the planet. So I just urge you, I'm just here to urge you to support the climate strike. And I understand you have a lot of hard work, so I'm going to stop talking so you can get on with it. Thank you. Robin Bloomgarden, followed by Stefan Streck. Okay, I was really mad when I got here, but I'm, it's been a long night, so <laughs> I'll probably be easier on you than I was going to be. Robin Bloomgarden, I'm in Claire's ward. Uh, Eugene has a democracy problem. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, Ms. City Attorney other than city attorney is what it says there. But in every discussion about the 5G question, I watch you continuously invoke federal law as the ultimate arbiter instead of taking a stand yourselves or with other cities banding together to put up a fuss about this whole damn thing. Uh, meanwhile, you and city council, all of you, are raking in tax money while at the same time regulating marijuana businesses, which you may recall are illegal at the federal level. Hello? Uh, this behavior is a major contradiction. Do any of you see this? Really? Um, especially if you won't even be proactive about the possible dangers of 5G technology while promoting pot use all over town. We, we know you already sent the letter to the FCC. Now you can just sit back and take no authority over the lives of your citizenry until it's too late, maybe. That letter is really only about protecting your income from selling pole installations and rights to the telecoms. That's the whole damn letter. You obviously have some motives for doing one and not the other. And I hope it's not that you're all afraid to stand up to power because we have a serious democracy problem here, people. Thank you. Thank you. Stefan Streck, followed by Michael Kerrigan. All right, City Council, uh, thank you all very much for joining us tonight. My name is Stefan Streck, and I live locally in Eugene, Oregon. I believe we've all met before. And I just got back from a brief vacation. I did 33 days in downtown Amsterdam and then five days in Iceland. I got to ride horses on lava fields, and it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place, Iceland. Very nice, very similar to here. Um, Amsterdam's also gorgeous. Now, a long time ago, Eugene used to be much, much nicer than Amsterdam. I can guarantee that. We had the most beautiful city in the world. It was gorgeous. It was safe. It was clean. And then all the Democrats started making their laws and hating homeless people and poor people and getting everyone arrested for no reason. 
Like, I was pulled over on my bicycle just before I went on vacation for not having a bike light. But I was wearing this jacket at, like, 2 in the morning on my bike. So I don't think it was for the bike light. I think it was for this jacket because it says made in Mexico. And I was going in between White Bird and the Circle K. I was actually on my way to meet a Mexican friend of mine. So I told him I got pulled over for the bike light, wearing the Mexican jacket, and he just laughed at me so much because he sees some of my other videos that I do, and he thinks this is really, really funny. I was not so amused. But anyways, so you want $20 million for more police services when I can't even get a police officer to show up when my car's broken into, but I get pulled over for not wear, having a bike light? How much does it cost just to give out free bike lights? And then you have a special election for this, and I get this in the mail. How much does it cost to print these out and mail these to everybody with, like, no notice? Blah, 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 23. I can translate this to Dutch, which actually is a lot faster because I speak Dutch now. Um, basically, it says, we know you didn't want this tax. We passed it anyways. A yes vote says we tax you more. A no vote says we still tax you more. And I checked your budget, 60% of the budget out of like $200 million, $50 million for police services, then you've got $25 million in reserves and $25 million left over. You don't really need more money. Anyways, so this is going on. There's literally no statement against it. But basically, there's something about... Homicide, rape, robbery, assault, sex offenses have increased 18% in the past few years. That's your fault. Thank you. Michael Kerrigan, followed by John Borofsky. Um, my name is uh, I'm Michael Kerrigan. I live in Ward 7. I love Ward 7. And I'm uh, speaking tonight rep representing CALC and 350 Eugene. The climate strike week was an amazing experience for me. What stands out is seeing those thousand plus students marching downtown from their schools to join the downtown rally. It brought tears to my eyes and chills to my spine and gave me hope that my 22 year old daughter will have a future. So please take action. I urge you to support the re resolution tonight supporting the youth led climate strike and, and also to enact the strongest possible climate, a climate action plan possible and declare a climate emer emergency. I'm also speaking tonight as a member of the NWCP's and Beyond Toxics Environmental Justice uh, uh, Committee to remind you of the disproportionate impact the pollution from the Baxter plant has on the Latinx and economically disadvantaged uh, communities in West Eugene, where I live. It's a justice issue. The city must do more to ensure that these communities have clean air to breathe. It's a basic human right that all of us are entitled to. I'm also uh, being further concerned about climate change. I rode my bike here tonight. And it was, I rode it just because it's a healthy thing to do, but also to help deal with cl climate change. Just, you know, in uh, encouraging you to do more to keep we bike riders safe here in Eugene. Thank you. Thank you. John Borofsky, followed by Ann Colt. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Um, tonight is City Manager John Reese's last Monday night public forum. Um, when John became city manager, the city was a quite different place than we see today. In his first years, the city was suffering from the recession of 2008-2009, and the city faced a $12 million budget shortfall. John and his staff were able to weather the storm with minimal dis uh, disruption to staff or service. Our downtown had several holes, literally, with new projects like the Broadway Commerce, Woolworth, and LCC downtown buildings. Eugene streets were in desperate need of repair. And with the successful passage of several street bond measures, today the pothole problem is not what it used to be. 
Programs like 15th Night and Operation 365 have been a good start to addressing the needs of some of our most vulnerable residents. We are well on our way to the redevelopment of the Eweb Riverfront property and steam plant in conjunction with a new vibrant river park. A new public safety strategy and revenue source has been identified and is in the process of being implemented, bringing staffing to a variety of needed categories to appropriate levels. Though the Friendship Bridge came down several years ago, I think that the relationship between the city and the county is at the best place it's been in years. All of the things I just mentioned, as well as many others, were accomplished with the hard work of many people, with policy direction from council. John and his staff have done a good job of bringing us to a place we are today. There is still a lot to accomplish in the city, but thanks to John's leadership, we have had a good foundation to build on. Over the last 11 years, I've had the opportunity to serve on several boards, committees, and commissions that in some way have had interactions with the city manager. In all of those cases and the interactions that I've had with John, whether we agree or not, he's always been willing to listen to other opinions and give them respect. So I'd just like to say thanks to John for his work over the last 11 years and uh, let him know that if he wants, uh, the supplemental budget is December 9th, and if he would like to testify, he can have three minutes. Um, I think Sarah Maderi said it the other day, you know, Public Works is about making uh, people in Eugene's lives better, and I think John has done that. Thank you. Thank you. Ann Colt, is Ann still here? No? How about Michael Townsend? Okay, and Michael will be followed by Thomas Hayura. Hi, good evening. My name is Michael Townsend, and I've lived in Lower River Road for the last 18 years. I think it's unincorporated Lane County. And well, I wanted to talk about the climate and also about 5G and and give the council a few resources you may not be aware of. Uh, with respect to 5G, I, I would like to see the council do a, a, a ban in residential areas, uh, maybe a six or one year rolling ban. And I say that I have bad EMF sensitivities myself and people, the, this technology, yes, they, we, we can't say what 5G is going to do because it hasn't been measured yet, but we know what 4G does. And the resources are a book called Overpowered, which is available at the Eugene Library by Dr. Martin Blank. And that covers the 2,500 studies that were done when he wrote the book in 2014. He's one of the leading experts in the world. He's, he's passed on. He was in his 80s. But that's an outstanding book. And just the... Uh, graphs in it, like comparing it to cigarettes, when they were known carcinogen, but they didn't. It didn't. The warnings didn't come, and the bans didn't come for 25 years later. It's the same with Agent Orange. He had a list of 20 different things. The death rate in the United States has gone up the last four years. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we've lost. Uh, we've lost eight months of lifespan as Americans. We've gone from 80.5 years life expectancy to 79 point, you know, 10 months. And since that, we're starting to go over. We could start losing two or three months a year in life expectancy with 5G. So the Clinton administration FCC Act of 1996, it was an overreach. The FCC shouldn't be deciding health issues for all of us. So that it's, I would like, I'd like to see uh, the city council and the mayor receive a raise. You guys are under a lot of heat. I was shocked to hear how little you're earning. Uh, I would suggest, I think, maybe 40000 a year for the counselors and 80000 a year for the mayor. You guys could pass that, you know, effective at the next election, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, so I wanted to talk also about uh, climate. And my background, I'm a retired professional photographer. 
Um, you can see my work at Getty Images under Michael Townsend if you put in bungee jumping and then you click on that image and my other images come up. But I'm one of the most published photographers living in Oregon, even though I don't have a website because I have chronic headaches, so I've just, you know, I'm just kind of taking it easy. But uh, look at the book Frankenskies and the movie, there's a movie called Frankenskies and then the website Geoengineering Watch. Please add the word geoengineering to your climate. It's not CO2, it's also geoengineering. It's man-made changes. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thomas Hayura, followed by our final speaker, Drix. Thank you. It's Hayura. Um, two issues. Music education is incredibly important. And also, I wish people who are uh, brave enough to come and speak here had more time. Somebody's hiding, it's crowding my spot. Somebody's cold wine is giving me chills. Guess I'll just close my eyes. Oh, yeah. All right. Feels good inside. Flip on that telly. Wrestle at Jimmy. Something is bobbling behind my back. Bottle is ready to blow. Save the fucking planet too. I can't confront you. I never could do that which might hurt you to try and be cool when I say In this way is a water slide away from me that takes you further every day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, your low E's about a half a step out. Very low. <laughs> <laughs> we have a long meeting, man. And, and finally, Drix. And here comes Drix, wiping up the rear. You look great. It's great to see you, Gene. I worked on it all week. Um, I'm glad to be here. <clears throat> I'm always glad to be here. I'm glad our wonderful you, John, is here. That's been his nickname. I know it's kind of tough to tell everybody that tonight. Um, but he's made a big difference. And he and I are both joined with the fact that we really admire Charlie Henry, the person who was with us that brought us to Holt Center. And I'm a little behind in my stuff. Sorry, aren't we all? So we didn't quite get our monument set up, but I'm working on it. I want a fun tribute for Charlie Henry to be hidden in the Holt Center 
where you have to go and find it. And then when you do, you have the third part put together in your mind and it's a hidden education. But that's it in the story. And it's not on my notes and I already shared a minute with that. Um, there's so much going on around us. There's so much connected to everything we're bringing up and, um, uh, and, and we get to solve it. I would like to suggest that we just, everything is so different, everything. Coming over here, I had my Bluetooth and I was listening to music and all of a sudden, as I'm walking down our wonderful streets, a phone call comes in on the same speaker and they say, thank you for calling Citibank or whatever. And that's odd. Try to explain that to somebody five years ago out of my speaker. I mean, the fact of what we're doing with our phones. So everything from here on has got to be different. And our name is Eugene, which starts with you. And it stops with you. All these issues that we're concerned with is uh, like G5. Um, there's so much more that's awful about that than just having them hanging on our poles. You guys are kind of hobbled by it. It was first to research it more. And please, everybody in Eugene, talk to your friends. Your friends are right here, and a lot of them are smarter than you. I try to be that way. <laughs> but it does help us. And we are the light of the world. I'm sorry. Oh, is our last name. And it's just, it's true. The country sees us. We've got to stand up for things. We've got to vote. Let's turn that around. A lot of issues that are being thrown in our face. For example, G5. Do you know the real motivation of it is what's going on in China, where citizens will be constantly monitored and they will have citizen points so they can get different jobs. It has nothing to do with our health. They don't care if we're not even here. So, Eugene, you got me here. You got me here 40 years ago. You saved my life. You gave me a purpose. And now I'm back because you invited me back to the voice of Dr. Ron Sheriffs. He said, go out there, learn all you can. We at the UVO touch all the world has. And when you're in a place of power, come back. Well, I didn't get financial power, but boy, I know how to talk. And I know how to love you guys. And I know how to love you guys. And we are all just one person, just one, just one. And that's a strong, smart person. Talk with your friends. Talk with everybody. Talk with me. Just talk and work it out. God love us. Thank you, John. Beep. No. <laughs> <laughs> it just needs a bit. There Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that? brings uh, to our arousing close our public forum. Are there counselors who wish to speak? Uh, Councilor Sayrat, Councilor Taylor. Ready? Yeah, oh, yeah. All right, go for it. Uh, thank you, everyone, who came to speak. Um, I've got, I might need two rounds, actually. I actually have quite a bit I want to respond to. So I owe my fellow counselors an apology, as I knew that advocates were going to come to speak tonight about a resolution regarding defending abortion access. I, and I meant to send that resolution out to my fellow counselors over the weekend, but I was sick with this cold and got behind on my council work. Um, I had considered introducing it today as part of items of interest but the city manager suggested that he would work with the mayor to find a spot on the agenda since our recent resolutions introduced in that format have generated quite a bit of conversation and he thought this one might too. Um, and so in order to avoid disrupting our planned agenda, he was going to look into this alternative approach with the mayor. So I look forward to that discussion uh, when we place it on uh, an agenda. And defending access to abortion and other reproductive services uh, is important. I hope my fellow council colleagues will support the resolution. I realize it might seem a bit outside the typical public policy issues this council might address, but adding our voice to those determined to defend abortion access is important. This is an issue of public health, family health, and individual autonomy. And while the people of Oregon have demonstrated strong support for maintaining true access to these services, there are challenges heading to the Supreme Court now that could strip this right away from millions of Americans. I wanted to address the criticism of Mr. Todd Boyle that we were not all attending uh, the boards and commissions that he saw some of our fellow counselors at. Uh, we are each assigned to different boards and commissions. 
Councillor Pryor and Semple happened to serve on the ones that Mr. Boyle attended, but each one of us has assignments to different boards and commissions that are chartered by the city. Uh, so that is one reason why we are all not at all those meetings. The other one is that we have quorum rules and if four or more of us show up at any one meeting at a time, it can be considered a city council meeting and we have to give prior public notice of that. Councillor Pryor, Evans and I serve on the Human Services Commission, which has helped move the TAC report. That was the focus of the forum in Cottage Grove. I couldn't attend that forum because I work a full-time job in addition to serving on this council. Um, you know, someone pointed out uh, that we uh, don't uh, earn a, a living wage at this uh, position. We are essentially glorified volunteers paid a stipend and we do as much as we are able to engage and understand the issues facing our community. I had two more comments I wanna make, so I'll take a second round, thank you. Okay, Councillor Taylor. Thank you. There is so much to talk about tonight. I, I, it was a really inspiring meeting, I thought. I'm sorry the college students left because they wanted to tell them they were great speakers as well as speaking for a good cause. I was amazed at how well, they spoke. Um, not that everyone else didn't speak well either, but for students, I thought they were extremely, extremely talented. I think that reproductive rights is really important. It's human rights. It's the rights of half of humanity, almost. Anyone who can have a child, who anyone who's capable of getting pregnant is in danger of having her rights taken away. And it is... Uh, it is extremely important. I didn't know what resolution they were talking about, but it's extremely important if we care about human rights, if we care about freedom of any group, that we certainly should care about the freedom of all females of childbearing age. Um, and any man who objects, I think, should be quiet unless he can find a way to get pregnant. <laughs> Um, what am I doing? Um, as for the bicycles, I, I think that's really important that we do need even more places for bicyclists to ride. I remember having the experience of suddenly seeing bicycle lane ends, and I thought, what do I do? I was, I was on 11th Street, and there was a lot of traffic. Um, that was after, when I first got here, the first day I was in Eugene, though, I checked into a motel and I said, is there a place to ride my bike? And they said, right there. And pretty soon I was on the river bike path and I thought, this is wonderful. And then I discovered the path through Amazon Park and, and I thought, these are wonderful people. Look at all the places they've made for people to ride bicycles. And I still think it's wonderful, but we do need more safety and more places and more, more safe paths. And it's really bad when you suddenly are riding and, and it says the end of the bicycle route, and also that people seem to very casually close the bicycle portion of the road, which is, we wouldn't do that to the car portion, I don't think, and uh, it was maybe it should be one side of the car portion closed and not the bicycle part. Anyway, I, th I thought it was a very, and the other really important, th well, er everything was important, but the other really important thing was the climate strike, I think. Definitely we should support, support that. And those people also were great speakers. And it was a really good evening of good speaking aside from good causes. Thank you all. Okay. Councilor Semple. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you to everyone who came to tell us all these important things. We listen and sometimes eventually we make some changes. We try hard. Um, the abortion rights are really important to me and um, I worry about the rest of the country. My 19-year-old niece lives in Montgomery, Alabama, and um, I hope she'll come visit me someday for not a medical need, but I'm glad that I'm here if she does. I really appreciate the, the huge group of people who came to speak about bike safety. That's a new topic for us, and it was very impressive, um, the number that came in, as Betty said, spoke so eloquently. Bike safety, bike use, CRO, CRO, CRO. Um, I believe that our 
transportation plan is being shifted somewhat to get um, bike lanes before some of the roads in response to concerns and the climate recovery goals. Um, we really do need more bike infrastructure. It doesn't um, always feel safe. I, I feel safe on the bike paths, but I don't ride in the traffic. And I'd like to see that get better. Something that needs to get better somehow right away is 18th and Hilliard. People are mad in their cars. You play chicken at the stop signs. But from the number of people who came and talked about that intersection, I will tell you that a month ago, I was coming out of Safeway on 18th, and a very pleasant but shook up young man asked me if I would give him a ride home about a mile back towards campus. Uh, he's a worker at Safeway, and on his way to work, he was hit by a car that did not stop. His bike was ruined. Um, he was in shock, and he'd lost a day's wages at least, which was about $100, and he was holding his arm. It's okay, it's okay, but um, I did break it before. So I'm really worried about him, but he's just one instance of what we have heard over and over again. So um, let's get on 18th and, and Hilliard right away. Um, we have a lot of work, as always, and I appreciate everyone coming to tell us how we should do it. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Zelenka. Yeah, I wanted to thank Claire, Councillor Syret, in advance for the resolution. She's going to bring opposing abortion bans around the country. Uh, the people that came and testified today made a great case and, and uh, told me some things that scared me more than I was already about this whole issue. And I've always supported a woman's right to choose and always will, and I can't wait for the resolution to come before us. The U of O students that spoke so well and were so organized about more safer streets and more bicycle infrastructure and linking the CRO with Vision Zero and our transportation plan, all those things get melded together in, in our, in our, in our uh, capital improvements program. All those things are wrapped together to, that we need to focus on to move those more, uh, that kind of infrastructure forward. The last thing I wanted to say is, and indeed it is John Reese's last Monday council meeting. Thank you, John, for all your service over the last 12 years. And um, one of the hallmarks of what made him a great city manager has been that while it appeared that we made it through the recession unscathed, the reality is that we made $30 million worth of cuts and made substantial changes in the way that we did business at the city. His hallmark is that he made it look easy. And, and so for that, I thank you, John. Councilor Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I too wanted to say a similar thing to John that um, your service has really been something over these last 10, 11 years, and I think you're the perfect duck, uh, calm and serene above water and paddling like crazy underneath. I think you've done an excellent <laughs> job of that. Um, there are so many things that you've accomplished and done in your time as city manager. One of the things that I'm always going to remember you for, though, amongst many, is the, the things that we did early on around trying to create a better sort of community culture when we had such a focus for a long time on on best outcomes versus worst fears. And I thought that was awesome. And I have to tell you, um, on, a, on a note very connected to that at, earlier in our meeting, um, my great grandma was a member of the North Central Montana Blackfoot tribe. And so when um, we had the resolution a while back to do the Indigenous People Day. I, I went along with that, and I voted in favor of that because I thought that was celebrating a positive more than dealing in the controversy of what was offensive and hard for some. Um, but I found uh, Joel's comments tonight um, really offensive, grotesque, and, and divisive at, at the beginning. And I really would hope that we could do something like that with much more positive um, kinds of conversation rather than the attack on Christopher Columbus that he listed for so long. Um, I'd rather we celebrated the positive things that bring people together 
um, rather than that kind of negativity and nastiness. So I hope we'll do better next time. Councilor Syrett, second Thank row. you. Yeah, so um, I also wanted to, the other thing I wanted to say was to thank the students who came to speak about the bicycle infrastructure. Um, I think we can do better, but I think in some cases we are trying to shoehorn new bicycle infrastructure into a current car-centric system, and that does create friction within our community and means we have to be especially thoughtful about how we go about doing that so that we can reach our Vision Zero goals and our climate recovery goals and do better uh, in providing more transportation options for everyone. And then I wanted to also thank John Borofsky for uh, his excellent overview of the accomplishments of John and his role as city manager. That was a great recap of his service to our community. But I will also add that one of our speakers tonight criticized the level of reserves that we keep in the city. And having those reserves in 2008 when I served on the budget committee, I was not yet a city councilor, the reserves were critical when we were facing a situation, a real possibility that the banks were going to fail and the money system in this country was going to seize up. But we had reserves in our city so we could meet payroll, meet, co continue to meet the critical work that the city does every day, traffic lights and other things that we all just take for granted because they're so much part of our daily routine. And we were able to get through that crisis because of John's leadership, because of his fiscal conservatism around our budget, and we were able to keep operating and meet our payroll without spreading the crisis throughout our whole city. So I really want to thank you for helping us weather that very, very serious crisis the way you did. Any other comments? Any other councillors? I want to just uh, say, say two things. Uh, one is we're, we have to remake a city in response to the changing climate, in response to our changing thoughts about transportation and those are that's a heavy lift we're we're remaking our city as we think about how we create more housing we're remaking our city as we think about how we are more inclusive and safe for everybody who lives there and some of that is owning the narrative of the past that's true and so I do think that it's important that we honor indigenous people's day I think as we go forward we'll find that we're endeavoring to embrace all of the different communities that live within our community with some, and, and that means we actually have to hold ourselves accountable also, also for our past. So we, we take responsibility for what we've done in the past, the good and the bad, and, um, and then my second comment with that is, is my gratitude to, to John Reese for his leadership. <clears throat> I came in as a, as a new mayor, and he had already had a a significant history with the city of Eugene and a lot of policies, and he was able to um, both both inform and 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 help me figure out how to do this job and uh, and work with the city council and work with the public and uh, and I think it's great that in your final public forum we had really some terrific presentations today and it was very interesting. So it's a nice nice send off for you as your final public forum. A raging green. <laughs> We didn't have the Raging Grannies, though. I don't know. That was, we, we did have Thomas, so that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Okay, that, uh, that closes the forum. We now actually have a few minutes of business to do. Okay. All right. Um, so I like this. first up is an action ordinance concerning protections for individuals and amending section 2.497 of the Eugene Code 1971. I move to adopt an ordinance ordinance concerning protection of individuals and amending section 2.497 of the Eugene Code 1971. Second. Any discussion, comment about this? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and that passes, thank you very much. And then there's- I don't see a resolution. I don't see a motion here, but- uh, I move to approve a resolution on youth -led, um, supporting the youth-led climate strike. Second. Would you like to speak to it? I'd like to speak to it. This comes from the Sustainability Commission. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't do it really, really fast and get it closer to the strike, but 
government moves slowly and we need to make sure the writing was just right. So here's the resolution. A resolution in support of the youth-led climate strike, Eugene, Oregon, on September 20, beginning a week of climate awareness actions through September 27, 2019, declaring a climate emergency and calling for full implementation of the Eugene, Oregon Climate Recovery recovery ordinance, CRO, and other immediate measures to restore a safe climate. There's, as usual, a long list of supporting facts and ideas. I'll just read a couple. On the City Council of the city of Eugene finds that on April 22, 2016, world leaders from 174 countries in the European Union recognized the threat of climate change and the urgent need to combat it by signing the Paris Agreement, agreeing to keep global warming well below 2, per, two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. On October 8, 2018, the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change released a special report which projected that limiting warming to the 1.5 degrees Celsius target this century will require an unprecedented transformation of every sector of the global economy over the next 12 years. People around the world have a fundamental right to clean, healthy, and adequate air, water, and land. Eugene, Oregon, by enacting a climate recovery ordinance into city policy, can hereby support this local youth-led climate emergency mobilization. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Council of the City of Eugene, a municipal corporation of the state of Oregon, as follows, Section 1, the Eugene City Council declares its support for the youth-led emergency climate strike September 20 through September 27, 2019. Section 2, the Eugene City Council applauds citizens, especially the youth, in their continuing efforts to take actionable steps to address the climate change emergency. And Section 3, this resolution is effective immediately upon its passage by the City Council. Discussion? Question? Oh, Councilor Zelenka. Yeah, um, I was at the climate strike with Emily, although we didn't see each other because there were so many darn people there that it was difficult to, to bump into any individual. Um, I was particularly impressed by the, the youth that were there, the hundreds of youth that showed up, especially from South Eugene and Churchill High Schools. Uh, I was disappointed in the 4J board for not letting him cut school to get there, but I thought the event was great. Um, as far as the resolution goes, um, I have vetted all the particulars in the resolution, so I'm not saying here or there about all the things that are in it, but I support the sentiment of it and support the, the youth strike that, that put forth and was actually a global phenomena uh, that was all over the, the world, people talking about it and, and, uh, and participating in it. So um, right on youth, and I'll support the resolution. Any other comments? All right, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you very much. I think that's excellent work. Thank you all for being here and for participating in your government. And we are adjourned.